Well, thank you very much. It's a, truly a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank Dr. Tory, Dr. Blank, Dr. Curtin for having me. Um, friends with all of them, and they're, they're, they're great people and uh, great doctors as well. And uh, it is truly a pleasure to be here. It's nice to not have to get on a plane to, to do one of these, so thank you. Yeah, I, I don't think the mic's on. Let me switch over. I'm going to switch to the. Okay, can you hear me now? Not great. Okay. Put it any closer, I'll be swallowing it. <laughs> All righty. Well, as I said, it is a pleasure to be here today, and I, I want to thank you. All of you for coming out on a beautiful Saturday. Uh, don't know what our attendance would have looked like if the weather was like it was yesterday, um, but there wouldn't be not any. There would be nothing else to distract you, so maybe it would have been good. So this is one of those sunny days in uh, the upper upper west side. There, um, our offices are uh, right over here. Uh, this is our building there. Um, it's not my sailboat. I wish it were. I probably wouldn't be here right now. So I'm here to talk to you about survival, which is a little bit interesting because you should really be telling me about survival, right? Uh, I think that one of the things we'll get into is, is that that's really the crux of this talk is that we really want to know what your perceptions of survival are. And what we've done is collect some data, and I'm here today to share some of that data with you. I think, first of all, there's a little background, though, and, and you have to understand survival means a lot of different things to different people. It's pretty obvious that if, if you're um, no longer walking the earth that you're, you're not surviving. Uh, there's some people though that we know who are walking the earth who you wonder if that's really any quality of life at all. And certainly that gets into, you know, how do you measure survival? How do you assess the quality of life? How does that all fit together? How do you measure survival in, in clinical trials? That sounds very simple, but sometimes it's not as simple as it sounds, and we'll get into some of those distinctions. And we'll talk about why some of these considerations of clinical trial endpoints become important. And I know you had some discussions this morning on clinical trials and so forth. And I'll try to sh shed some light in terms of what it means uh, with regards to survival. Um, and then we'll get into talking about what we think it means to you. And, and it'll be great to hear from you as well. Um, we're, we're, fit into that. So when we look at a clinical trial or when you read a study, there's a lot of parameters that one can look at in terms of the effectiveness of the particular agent that's studied. And so we can look at the response rate. And how do we measure response rate? Kevin Holcomb just spoke uh, previously about using CA125s in clinical trials, such as with GCIG criteria and so forth. Well, that's one way we can do it. We can also look at scans and see that the tumor shrunk, and we now have very formalized <coughs> regimens that indicate to the clinician whether the tumor has shrunk by a certain amount, and, and we can then talk in a common language across medical centers and across countries as to what the effect of a particular drug was based on the changes we see in the tumor um, on a scan. The problem with ovarian cancer, if, if we sort of focus on an ovary, is that we really um, I can't figure out how to get this any higher other than clip it to my chin. Um, I'll hold it up. But the, uh, if we look at ovarian cancer, I think that it's a little more difficult than it would be with other solid tumors. So let's take, for example, sarcoma. With a sarcoma, it's usually very easy to measure. It has very defined borders, and so it's a 10 by 8 centimeter tumor. Then we give you treatment and we can see that it shrunk to a three by three centimeter tumor. Well, we know by that criteria there's been a very nice response and we can quantitate that very easily. The problem with ovarian cancer is it's often very small volume disease that's widely distributed. So you may have something that's a centimeter or two here, a centimeter there, a couple specks there. Some of those specks may be just post-operative changes and they're not really tumor, but we, we, we're not sure. Um, so it becomes more difficult. To, to measure. It's hard to measure things in lymph nodes unless the entire lymph node's replaced as well. So there's a lot of interesting things when it comes to response rate. The other things we can look at are time to progression and, and more commonly what we call progression-free survival. Now the word survival's in there and that's confusing to people because they think survival means you're either dead or you're alive. 
In this case, what we're talking about is have you had any evidence of the cancer coming back? So have you quote unquote progressed? Kind of a strange term if you think about it. It's really not progress, is it? It's kind of going backwards. Um, but nonetheless, we use that term. And then of course, overall survival, I think everyone understands. Uh, it's very binary. You're either dead or you're alive. And, and that's certainly something that's very easy to measure, but that has problems too. So you would think, well, Every study should just have overall survival as its endpoint, but there's problems with that, and, and I'll try to speak to some of those. So, you know, would we be better off trying to come up with some weighted average of all these, including quality of life and, and patient-reported outcomes such as symptom control, um, look at cost analysis and, and all those types of things? And the answer is yes, but the problem is coming up with a, a system that would be able to be validated that would give us that total score. And there's people working on this, and I hope that in the next decade we have more progress in this area because I think we need a better understanding of the metrics that go around. Not only did your tumor get smaller, did you live a little longer, but what was the impact on the rest of your life? What kind of symptoms did it produce? What kind of long-term symptoms did it produce? What was the economic impact of that treatment? So there's a lot of other things that we need to consider. This is what I was referring to in terms of the overall survival issue. And, uh, excuse me, sorry. Um, so what we're looking at here is, is if, if um, we start treatment here, this is the, the time of progression-free survival until that first recurrence, okay? So here we're at recurrence. And then this is the post-progression survival. And what we've seen with ovarian cancer is the PFS has uh, gone out considerably but this post-progression survival has increased even more. So most of our survival statistics have actually seen a large benefit in this area um, that's extended out. And, that, and therefore, there's subsequent treatments here, 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 here. So we don't know if this first treatment impacted that or whether it was the second treatment, third treatment, fourth treatment, fifth treatment. So you have confounding, if you will, in terms of blurring the effects of different treatments. So it makes it very difficult to tell if one drug influenced overall survival, or it was the combination of the drugs, or it was two out of the three. But you can't just say that it was just one drug, and that makes it more difficult uh, in many cases. So ovarian cancer uh, is not just one disease, and that's certainly, I think, one thing that's coming through. If you look at our new clinical trials, we know that different cell types, different tissue types, histo histologies have different outcomes. Um, and we know there's different pathways that are activated. And, and then you throw all that into the complexity of what I was just talking about in terms of trying to interpret these clinical trials. And it makes it very difficult for you as patients to take this data and really make sense of it. And I think that that's, uh, that's very difficult for you. If we look at the survival trends that we've seen, I think this is very interesting data. This was uh, adapted from um, some European data in, in the Netherlands. Um, but what, what we see here is that we've, you know, we've had improvements that have been significant in terms of especially five-year survival improvements. Um, and that's been uh, quite noted, in, especially if you look at the contribution um, to the, um, let me just turn back here, to the, to the group from the data that we had coming out um, from 98 to 2003 was the greatest contribution to that. Um, so this is the percent of the improvements that we've seen. Uh, and most of that has come from the taxane and platinum era, if you will. And we've seen some uh, improvement in the last 10 years where we've had several novel agents come out as well. We haven't really changed 10-year survival as much as we have three- and five-year survival. So the goal is to try to move these curves even further out and to actually cure more patients than what we're currently curing. It's a critical question, you know, when we talk about composite endpoints and, and all these other things, is what do patients want? What do they want out of a trial? And some of these things sound somewhat simplistic, but they're not. Uh, and to try to uh, understand this a little bit better, um, uh, Rob Coleman, myself, um, and, and some colleagues, Ronnie Alvarez uh, and, and Jessica, who's uh, with the SGO office, uh, tried to come up with a survey that would reflect what patients' desires are in terms of clinical outcomes and so forth. So, this is looking at, uh, again, the survivor difference that we talked about. And, and what you can see here is the, the phase three differences um, in progression-free survival. So we've had good improvements in progression-free survival, 
We're, but most of the time, we haven't seen a, an improvement in overall survival for most of the studies other than the JGOG study with dose dense in the last 10 years. So most of the studies that have come out have shown that we can improve the time to recurrence, but we haven't reflected a big change in overall survival in the newer studies. And that's because we think, again, because of that confounding of now that we have so many active agents that we treat with subsequently that we're blurring those effects. So if we put you on an active agent um, versus placebo, but then you would get either that active agent, which would be crossover, or a similar active agent, then that would cause that inability to see the difference in overall survival. And, and so that's, it certainly makes it very difficult. But it raises a very provocative question. Should we be using progression-free survival as an endpoint or not? And that's, that's a little bit uh, of a different discussion than, than really where I want to go today. I want to focus on the survey and talk a little bit about that. So what we wanted to do was assess the patient preferences and look at uh, some of the trade-offs that you have between efficacy and toxicity and try to get an idea of you know, really what the desires of patients are. So we did this 28-question uh, anonymous online survey um, looking at, you know, usual information in terms of demographics, and then we wanted to ask some questions, and, and I'll get right into it so we don't have to tell you what we did. I'll just show you what we did here. So this was the survey online, uh, and uh, we collaborated with the Ovarian Cancer National Alliance, and they have their, their annual meeting in July, and it's coming up again this next July. And we posted this online and, and did the marketing for it. And we had a wonderful response of over 2,000 patients, of which 1,000 um, out, of, out of the 1,400 who responded, out of over 1,000 were complete responders. And in other words, they answered all the questions, almost 75%, uh, which is very good for a survey. And these are the breakdown, not surprisingly, since it was the Ovarian Cancer National Alliance. 93% had ovarian cancer instead of other cancers. And these are the demographics. The median age was about 60. Um, it was overwhelmingly Caucasian who responded to the surveys. And you see here, uh, just to give you a, a snapshot of where people were in the life cycle of treatment for ovarian cancer, 60% um, uh, uh, had not recurred, 40% uh, had recurred, uh, and, and uh, about a quarter of those were actually on treatment at the time uh, of taking the survey. So it gives you some idea of really where we are, and about 30% um, uh, overall had, were on treatment when they took the survey. So these are the uh, number of regimens that these patients who responded had had. So as you can see, the, the majority had had only one, but um, when we look into the recurrent setting, you see uh, how many had four or more. So um, heavily pretreated groups, so certainly a knowledgeable group for sure in terms of thinking about toxicities, thinking about what one would want with efficacy and so forth. So um, I think a really good uh, patient group to survey. So uh, <laughs> we were interested because uh, we, we made these um, surveys up and, and I, I feel badly because uh, we obviously missed the sweet spot. And, um, we were talking about this earlier, just I uh, was talking with uh, a survivor about this right before I went on the podium. It's very interesting because our clinical trials, the debate in our clinical trial world, and, and so we get caught up in our own world of statistical significance and how do you design a trial with the, uh, a power to show a difference, how many patients is it going to require, um, all these things that go into the statistical design of a trial. And what we look for is something that is hopefully clinically meaningful, but has to be statistically meaningful as well. So it's easier to hit the statistical bar sometimes than it is the clinically meaningful bar. And obviously, what patients want is even a higher bar. And, and so what we were interested in, we, we assumed that most people would not be interested in, in and we asked them what the minimum amount that they'd be interested in going on a, a trial if we knew that it provided, or a drug, would, if it provided one month improvement in PFS. Nah, not interested. Two, still not interested. Three, well, that's where a lot of our trial endpoints are coming out, three to four months. If you look at GOG 218 with bevacizumab, for example, 3.8 months. ICON 7 with bevacizumab, a little under three months. And so we were thinking the sweet spot in here, people would probably be 
willing as a minimum, this isn't what you want, desire, but as a minimum, probably three months would be around the sweet spot we'd find. Well, we saw a little blip there, as you can see, but we really missed it. Um, everybody said five or more months. So now we have to really ask that question again and, and, and go much higher to really see what that minimum would be. Because um, it certainly doesn't fit into the clinical trialist world. Um, so I thought that was very interesting data. Very similar with the overall survival data as well. So it, it didn't matter whether we looked at uh, overall survival. Uh, uh, this is OS and PFS. Um, this is uh, looking at PFS and we broke it down by recurrence or no recurrence. And it, as you can see, it really didn't matter. Um, and there are some subtle differences uh, between patients who have recurred and who have not recurred throughout the survey, uh, but this was not one of them. Same with overall survival, uh, almost identical whether they had recurred or not recurred. How important is stable disease? Um, there, there was a uh, difference there. It doesn't look like a very big difference, but remember the large number of uh, patients here, so it became statistically significant in that those who had recurred we're a little more accepting of stable disease, a little more. But uh, you can see there's quite a dichotomy here um, with a large number who, are, who do not accept stable disease and a large number who do. What do we mean by stable disease? That means your disease is not progressing, nothing's getting worse. Uh, on the other hand, it's really not shrinking. So if you're on therapy, uh, the optimist would say it's keeping things at bay. Uh, you're, you're not having any progression of disease. Okay, the, the pessimist would say, it's not working, so it's sort of how you look at it. And so um, two different perspectives there, and you can see the difference uh, that patients reflect in that too, not surprisingly. We then tried to um, do a little bit of what we call trade-off exercises to understand the elements behind what people would tolerate in a particular compound. Some of these drugs that we have are fairly toxic, as you know, and so the question is, you know, what's what are we really seeing with this? And so we asked the question, if you could have an improvement in progression-free survival, meaning that you're not improving your overall survival, but just time to recurrence by three to four months, but there's no difference in overall survival, but this drug has zero toxicity. You can go on your, uh, on your way, you can work, you can do everything you wanted to do, and you really don't have any toxicity. You don't even know you're on the drug. Would you prefer that, or would you prefer a drug who gives you a five to six month improvement in overall survival but it gives you three times neuro neurotoxicity. So you have fairly severe neuropathy, and we went into an actual description of what that would mean uh, in terms of how it would feel in your fingers and your feet and so forth. Um, and we obviously had a split here, but the majority would take the overall survival benefit and the toxicity. Um, you can see also that a uh, significant number of people said, neither of those is uh, really what I want. Do, do better than that for me, please. Financial concerns, one of the things that's certainly come to light is uh, financial toxicity. And that's certainly true of some of the new targeted agents, and it's a very big concern uh, that we have as physicians, as your advocate, uh, is the cost of some of these new therapies. Um, and there's certainly stories of uh, uh, patients and families going bankrupt to take on some of these therapies, and it's, it's really quite disturbing. Uh, so it's certainly something that we need to consider, uh, more so than what we have in the past. Uh, some of these cost up to $10,000 a cycle, and if it's not covered, uh, it doesn't uh, take a, an accountant to figure out that uh, you could certainly uh, go broke uh, if you require many, many cycles of treatment. Um, so this is looking at uh, this group, and I think we had a bit of a select group, to be honest with you. I'm not sure this is reflective of uh, the... United States as a whole, um, but it uh, gives you some idea. We did uh, see uh, some major changes, bankruptcy and so forth, uh, with probably about 15% uh, of the people. And then if you add that all up with significant, about a third of the patients in this survey, even who I consider a fairly select group, uh, still thought financial concerns were something that were in the forefront. So I think that's important to keep in mind. In terms of toxicity, I, I'm not going to show you all the data. We asked this in a, in a lot of different ways, um, but this is sort of the summary, if you will. Um, and uh, you know, it was interesting that uh, infection um, was cited as one of the worst uh, things when I've seen other surveys where nausea is, is cited as the worst thing. So 
you know, once again, it, it's a, it's a, it is a large number, but it's a large number of ovarian cancer patients. And it's very interesting to, to look at this data. Um, and hospitalization was the second worst thing, uh, which I always try to preach to our residents and to our, my partners that uh, people do not like to be in the hospital unless they absolutely have to be. And uh, I think that's well borne out in this uh, survey. Is there a difference between recurrence um, and no recurrence? There was a little uh, uh, difference there. Um, uh, generally, people who were in the recurrence setting were less willing to tolerate toxicity, and, and that was fairly clear. Uh, and you can see that uh, represented here as well if you go on the side by side here. Um, the, the, if you have the first line therapy and your chances of cure are high, in general what we found is that patients are much more willing to put up with significant toxicity. If we are dealing with a situation where we're trying to extend your life for as long as possible, but unlikely to cure, toxicity becomes a much more important variable for most patients. And if we asked in a, a rank order of one through eight, what is the most important thing to you, not surprisingly, cure. Um, so we get the message uh, and completely understand uh, why that would be. So next steps, uh, the SGO has a white paper coming out to, to address some of these issues. Uh, this will also be written up. And um, I think we probably need to uh, re-ask some of these questions, as I said, because we obviously missed getting the sweet spot. You'd like to have hit that minimum, and obviously we don't know what more than five months is, you know, in terms of what that PFS is um, that, that uh, people would like to see. Obviously, uh, and remember that's the minimum, not, not what the optimal would be. So we need a little better handle on that. So I want to thank uh, my co-investigators um, and uh, especially all the people who participated in the survey, and some of you are in the room, so I want to thank you so much and the folks from uh, OCNA. So our patients do have clear opinions, um, and I, I think we need to listen to our patients in terms of what those opinions are because they can help shape the research agenda, and they should sh help shape that agenda. Um, after all, the, the reason we do these studies is for the benefit of the patients, and therefore they should have a voice. Um, and it's very interesting to look at the uh, level of toxicities people are willing to put up with, and I think we need to do a little more research around that and obviously try to minimize those toxicities where possible, but having that insight, I think, is very important. So we hope to do further research in this area. So thank you very much.